We're ready to resume. This should be a very interesting panel as we go and I thank uh, Aspen Institute for the extraordinary presence of so many experienced and diligently dedicated people in this battle to keep America safe and free. I'm Bill Webster, formerly director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and formerly director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And for the last decade, it has been my privilege to be chairman of the Homeland Security Advisory Council, which gives advice and counsel to the secretaries of Homeland Security from the very beginning, Governor Tom Ridge, Michael Chertoff, Janet Napolitano, and more recently, Secretary Johnson, whom we heard from earlier in the week. A great deal has changed in all those years. I think back to 35 years ago in 1980, when I made the decision to make terrorism one of the four priorities of the FBI. We were experiencing 100 terrorist incidents at that time. They moved in aggressively and intelligently, improved the intelligence capacities. And when I moved over to CIA in 1987, the number of terrorist incidents had been reduced to six. No more that story. The changes over time have required additional tools, additional skills, and additional approaches to a very difficult subject as we strive to keep this country both safe and free. The panel this morning is uniquely qualified to discuss that change and whether new tools are needed and what approaches need change. I've had the privilege of working with each of these individually over time in various ways. And while our moderator will give you more details, I can say that they are both distinguished and accomplished. And America is truly in their debt for all that they have made possible and continue to contribute. Our moderator this morning is Noah Schnapp-Schockman, himself a distinguished journalist, and uh, is executive officer of the Daily Beast, He's a former non-resident fellow of the Brookings Institution and has reported from all over the country and all over the world, including difficult areas such as Afghanistan, Israel, Iraq, Qatar, Russia, Kuwait, and elsewhere. He's perhaps best known as the founder and editor of Wired Magazine's national security site, Danger Room, which won a national magazine award for reporting in digital media and online journalism award for the best reporting. It's a privilege to have our moderator and the members of the panel. And Noah, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, before we get started, uh, Clark, uh, thanks so much for putting this together. Um, it, it's just, it's an extraordinary event. It's an extraordinary setting. And I think it's extraordinary that we, everybody here kind of like wrestles with these amazingly difficult issues and sort of does it in a spirit of goodwill and nice. Uh, and it, it's, it's really impressive to see. And, and Clark, I think, you know, tone comes from the top and, and I think you've set an amazing tone here. So thank you very much. Um, our panelists, um, if you're in this room, the chances are like 99% that you know our four panelists, but on the off chance that you do not know them, uh, immediately to my left, uh, Fran Townsend, uh, formerly at the White House, now at uh, McAndrews and Forbes. Uh, General Michael Hayden, formerly of a little thing called the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency, uh, now at the Chertoff Group. Uh, Matt Olson, uh, formerly at uh, National Car Terrorism Center, now at Iron Net Security. Is that am I saying right? Yeah, okay. And uh, John Pistol, formerly at the TSA and the FBI, and now the president of Anderson University in his hometown in Indiana. Um, guys, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm gonna start out with a super duper duper easy question, okay? Uh, the other day, uh, Bob Cardillo, the head of uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, said that uh, the intelligence community was late to warn about the rise of Syria, the chaos, I mean, the rise of ISIS, chaos in Syria. This is after, trillions of dollars spent on military and intelligence operations in the Middle East. 
Uh, this is after a huge buildup of the intelligence agencies. Like, how could you miss something that big? What, how did that happen, and what do you have to do to change that? You're looking at me. I'll start with you. <laughs> I noticed Matt was looking away, so I figured, like. <laughs> well, first of all, Clark, Roy, very meaningful for you to include the National Security Alumni Association in the, in the meeting. So thank you. Um, yeah, so in the American military, we, we, we divide the battle foot up between the close fight and the deep fight. And in the war on terror, the close fight is taking care of people who are already convinced they want to come kill you. And the deep fight is more ideological. It's about the production rate of people who might want to come kill you in one, three, five, ten years. And, and, and very candidly, we've become very good at the close fight and somewhat at the expense of, of the deep fight. And so Matt and I were talking yesterday. We, we, we create exquisite intelligence to, to do the kind of targeting that Congresswoman McSally talked about with almost no collateral damage against senior leadership. And that is highly consuming of the energies of the American intelligence community. Uh, an awful lot of what we still call analysis in American intelligence is targeting. And frankly, my old agency, CIA, although it is still the nation's global espionage service, has never looked more like OSS than it, than it does today. And so I, I think what might have happened, Noah, is that we were so focused on this day-to-day -day operational task that we didn't see the long view. Uh, to simplify that, we we're so busy chopping down trees, we didn't pay enough attention to the, to the second growth forest that was happening over here and probably didn't alert policymakers soon enough. Fran, do you agree with that? I do. Um, I also think that it's, it, it may be that, look, we had Al-Qaeda, and we had been, to Mike's point, so focused on Al-Qaeda core, and across two administrations had been, have been incredibly successful. And this really is another permutation, let's be honest, of it, it's quite different. It's taken a quite different turn, and we can talk about how ISIS is different from the Al-Qaeda ideology. But it really is an outgrowth of that extremist ideology that prizes death over life, that is the antithesis of a sort of a free society. And so I think in some ways, that nuance, that outgrowth, um, we've seen it at QAP, we've seen Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. This was fundamentally different, but it was another permutation. And I think that nuance is also the kind of thing you miss when you're focused on the tactical. Um, we've heard a lot of talk uh, last couple of days about counter narrative, counter messaging. And um, I have to say, I understand almost none of that talk um, after, even after hearing it uh, so often. And the part that's so confusing to me is something that um, Congresswoman uh, McSally said, which is how do you have a counter message when, uh, as she put it, it looks like ISIS is taking on America and winning. So I guess, Matt, I'll throw this to you, is like how do you do countering violent extremism, CVE, when ISIS has got a state in Iraq and Syria, and has all these subgroups popping up in Africa and, and in the Middle East. Like, isn't the deed of the caliphate more important than whatever, you know, message we're going to put out? Right. So, you know, no, I think you have to kind of do both. I mean, you have to be successful in Iraq and Syria over the long haul. You have to defeat the narrative uh, on the ground that ISIS is successful. And right now, that has been one of the dominant narratives we've seen coming out of Iraq and Syria in particular is the, the success that ISIS has had. So we have to take the fight to them there and we have to be successful there. We have to put them on more on the heels than there are. We have to start regaining territory. That's the long, uh, real, the long and most difficult challenge we face uh, overseas uh, from a counterterrorism perspective. But at the same time, you have to be successful countering the message here. And that's a different set of challenges. Um, that is really the core of the countering violent, violent extremism messaging to reach out to communities, to religious leaders in the United States, a domestic effort uh, to, the voices are there. The, the people are there who are countering that message, but those voices need to be amplified, as many people have said over the past few days. And as Congresswoman McSally said, there are uh, woefully inadequate resources put behind that effort. I mean, and a few dozen people in the federal government, but really that needs to be spread out into, the, into uh, state and local governments, into, into communities with more 
money and more people to really be successful, to counter the message, to build the trust with those communities that are most susceptible to that message so that they feel comfortable, they understand the message, they feel comfortable coming forward to local police, to the FBI when they see signs of radicalization. That's, that's the challenge. And one of the problems I think that we face in the CVE effort is it's very hard to measure success. Um, and we're going to be able to at some point look back and say we've been successful, but it's hard to do that in the short term. And we've seen a lot of bogus programming in the name of CVE because it's so hard to measure. Right? Well, it's hard for the government to do. The government's not as good as it, at it. Uh, obviously, it's, it's about credible voices in uh, religious communities and, and in local communities, and we need to amplify those voices. No, kind of let me speak to this for a second. This, this so incenses me that together with Senator Joe Lieberman and Ambassador Mark Wallace, I started a nonprofit here in the United States. We now have operations in Europe uh, and around the world. It's called the Counter-Extremism Project. The government, this is not one administration or the other. The United States government is decidedly lousy at this. Everybody talks about it as being a priority. By the way, when somebody tells you, sits up here and tells you it's a priority, ask yourself two questions. How much money are you putting against it? Because rhetoric doesn't matter here. How much money and how many bodies? You heard Congresswoman McSally say two dozen people. Um, and by the way, the best intentioned people inside the US government are going to have a hard time being effective because they're not credible voices against the people they're targeting. This isn't just. It, part of it is outreach to Muslim communities in the United States, but that's one very small piece. You really have to look at what is, what is it you're trying to counter, right? Some of this, you're, it is true to say you've got to do both the hard power fight You've got to take the momentum away from them so you have a message. But you also, this is a matter of contesting them on the battlefield that is the internet. We do not, Congresswoman McSally alluded to this, we have to understand that the internet is as much a battlefield that we must contest as is air, space, and water. We do not behave that way. We do not program that way. We do not budget that way. And we do not act that way. There are players in this room, SAP, Raytheon, who have tools and capabilities that would allow us to do a both tactical and strategic effort to deny them that battle space and push back on their propaganda. But these small programs, these discrete programs, whether it's in the State Department or Homeland Security, by themselves will never will never make a difference. And I'm sorry, what does internet as battlefield mean? That means as a, as a communication, psychological battlefield? Does that mean something else? No, it, it's in all aspects, right? So there's how do you look at how your enemy uses a particular physical space. You look how they use the internet. They use it for planning, training, communications. They use it for propaganda. And in each of those verticals, you have to contest it. Up to now, the, particularly, look, the one I know the best right now because of the nonprofit I started is social media. We do not sufficiently contest that battle space, which is why we started a nonprofit. By the way, when, when we do decide to turn our attention and put funding and resources against this, understanding that the United States government itself cannot be the most credible voice, you do have to recognize you're going to fund groups outside the government, NGOs, there's one in London, not in my name, this Quillam Society. You've got to fund groups that are credible voices but don't have the resources to take that battle and fight for you. Um, a big part of this counter-messaging stuff is, is engendering some trust between police and local communities, right? That, that's the most natural place that a you know, local imam or what have you is going to go to. Um, and yet, mistrust of the police in this country has arguably hasn't been this high in decades, right? Um, you've got you know all of these shootings, uh, you know uh, the Freddie Gray uh, kind of shootings of of unarmed black men in this country, and and I, and I wondered whether the mistrust between um, police and communities in any way undermines this um, effort to kind of do outreach. Um, John, Matt, you one of you guys want to take? <laughs> Well, I can talk about it from, uh, from my FBI days in perspective of the, the importance of working closely with state and local police with nearly 800,000 uh, sworn officers across the country and uh, you know, 18,000 uh, police departments and sheriff's offices. And if, if there's confidence in the rule of law generally in a community, that's obviously a threshold question. Um, and assuming there is confidence in the rule of law, meaning that the laws are being applied fairly, equitably, 
Then it really comes down, in many instances, to personalities, starting with the chief of police, and then obviously those on, out on patrol, those who are doing neighborhood watches and things with uh, the local communities, to assess what is that, is that confidence justified. And the International Association of Chiefs of Police, which I served on their executive board for, for 12 years at the FBI and continuing at TSA, um, works hard with those local communities and departments <coughs> To, to make sure that those two aspects are being addressed, that there is confidence in the rule of law generally in the community, not, not talking about just some esoteric uh, uh, notion, but in that community, is that rule of law being followed generally? Uh, there may be some one-offs. And then there, is there confidence in the leadership and then how that leadership is directing the men and women in blue or whatever their uniforms are to uh, carry out that mission? Can I just Go ahead. maybe broaden the perspective a little sure. bit? Everything, everything here is correct. And, and, and deserves great focus because it's the most immediate impact on the American homeland. And, and Director Comey kind of hit this theme when asked, what's the biggest danger you face? It's ISIS. That surprised me a little bit because I actually think Al-Qaeda still remains the most capable foreign terrorist organization to mount big attacks against the United States, especially the unit in, in Yemen. That said, if I were FBI director, I would have given you the answer ISIS because that's the problem we focus on law enforcement to deal with because it's domestic, almost individuals, sui generis coming out of American society, not foreign-based plots. But the broader picture is absolutely tectonic shifts in one of the world's great monotheisms in one of the world's most important regions. Iraq, Syria, probably Lebanon, certainly Libya, they're gone, and they're not coming back. What does and that so mean? It means, it means that as the European state system imposed on that region 100 years ago right, was never a natural act, and now with the removal of external power, whether it was empires, the Cold War, or Arab autocrats, all the natural tensions are coming to the surface, and these states have effectively dissolved, and frankly, in my view, will not come back as the entities we, we used to know. And that's why you so had- So you're saying kiss Iraq goodbye kiss Syria goodbye, kiss all these states goodbye. That's what I said. <laughs> okay. That's how fundamental the shift is, all right? And, and so we, we need to base our policy on the reality that, as several speakers have said, this is kind of a generation and change issue that's coming at us. So you've got that geopolitical tectonic really causing the earth to shake, and then you've got a religious tectonic. And let me, let me be a, a little controversial here. This is about Islam. Um, it's all about Islam. Now, it's not about all of Islam, and it's not about all Muslims. But fundamentally, there is a civil war within a great monotheism. And what we're worried about here, showing up in Chattanooga, all right, is, is essentially the indirect effects or the collateral damage to this great, really, epochal struggle now going on. And, and I don't think we get to the right answers in policy until we understand what the real gain here is. Now, we do all that stuff here. That's right. All right? But you know, it was mentioned in the last, last session. What are, the, what are the core causes here? What are the fundamental things? I think those are the fundamental things, and those have to be the things around which we organize our policy. And to come back to my answer to your first question, we're out here killing very, very bad people, which is a very, very good idea. But you've got this broader question that we're only now, I think, beginning to recognize. In fact, in fact, we are afraid to articulate what I think is one of the great questions, which is, it is about Islam. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, am I, first, am I, am I done now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Uh, um, is, first of all, I'd like to get the panelists' uh, feedback on whether they think uh, Iraq and Syria are really gone as states. Matt, John? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that at, from the perspective of my job at, as the director of the National Counterterrorism uh, Center, which was uh, t to agree with you, Mike, to the extent that when we looked at the problem of Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda's ideology and, and, and of terrorism, uh, sponsored by Al-Qaeda, you could track it directly to these countries that were undergoing great unrest, great instability, and a lack of governance. So there is the, obviously, uh, perhaps obviously, a direct correlation between a lack of governance, a, lack, uh, a lack of security, and the taking root of Al-Qaeda's ideology. So you look at uh, uh, Yemen, 
uh, Iraq, Syria, you go across North Africa from Somalia to Libya to Mali, and all of those places are really have at various times and to various degrees been incapable of securing their borders or uh, you know pr pr providing for their citizens, and that's where the ideology of Al Qaeda has taken root. So um, it is that the fundamental problem, and it's a and the real problem in some ways for us as citizens is this is a as you put it, Mike, a generational problem. We are going to be dealing with this for a long, long time, and we have to have the sustained attention and sustained uh, investment to uh, understand the nature of that problem and to, you know, over time, invest in these countries in a way that will help build their capacity to take on, uh, take on the ideologies that give, root, you know, give rise to terrorism. So at least from the terrorism perspective, I certainly agree with you, Mike, with respect to why we see uh, al-Qaeda take root. Right, but that's a, he said something way further out. I which was a different question, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you buy well, that? Let me, let me just clarify, all right? Mm -hmm. A policy based on success being defined as the restoration of those states as we know it denies you an awful lot of options that are probably more productive in dealing with the unrest we're seeing here. Got it. John, you agree with that? Well, so I'm not sure a uh, FBI TSA guy should be opining on, about future <laughs> states. Yeah. Uh, but what I would go back to is this notion within the U.S. government on the whole counter-violent extremism issue. I think sometimes we get so caught up in the insular nature of this discussion within, within the Beltway particularly, and then the outreach efforts from Washington on that. Having just moved back to the Midwest, I would say that there is little to, to no interest in this whole CVE narrative unless you are directly affected by it. So were people in Chattanooga uh, dealing with this issue? Were people in Garland, Texas, other than the fact that they were hosting, one group was hosting uh, this you know, Prophet Muhammad uh, issue? Um, I think the vast majority, if there's 330 million people in the U.S., I would say that 320 million people are not focused on this at all. They are, they are looking at those core issues uh, about the economy, jobs, crime, safety, drugs, gangs, things like that. And this is really going past uh, being out of government now. I see that U.S. government effort and what's happening uh, across the country as going at, at just past each other. So I think sometimes we make so much about that. To Matt's point, I think, and, and to Fran's point, I think it's much more a uh, private-public partnership um, and oftentimes just a private effort and local communities, uh, and the, fast, the fact that uh, a local imam wants to take responsibility. No imam that I think any of us have ever dealt with wants to be the imam that has a Sarnayev in his, in, uh, in, in his mosque. They don't want that. that that's just ter terrible for them and for Islam writ large. So I think there is that, that notion, and it, it's a question of how can the US government work more effectively uh, than what we've done in the past. Um. Okay, I want to. I agree with all of that, uh, <laughs> but I want to uh, try to take General Hayden's uh, pretty controversial ideas and see if, uh, and try to unpack them just a little bit more. Fran, can I get you to bite on that? Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Look, I, I, I let me add to what he's saying. <laughs> One, I, I do believe that this is fundamentally a conflict within Islam. What you're seeing is this. You see, not only initially what we believed this controversy to be this battle was between the Shia and Sunni pieces of Islam. And I think fundamentally that's broken down further to be a battle even within the Sunni branch of Islam for what it means to be a Sunni. And by the way, I, nobody up here for sure is, is qualified or credible to opine on how that, that ought to get itself resolved. And that's fundamentally what's under, undergirding General Hayden's remarks. Now. Uh, where, how do I think you, over the long term, what, is, what are the implications of that? I think you are going to see fundamental changes in the states we know as Iraq and Syria and Yemen. I don't know that I'm prepared to go all the way to say we will not see states as we understand them today. I don't think we know that quite yet. I think we are closer to where General Hayden is suggesting it ends up than I would have expected we would be. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think we can't lose sight of the fact that we both have an a national interest and a national ability to influence outcomes and how that shapes itself. And so look, we've spent years in theater at war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And frankly, if you look at history, we had a Marshall Plan for Europe and we had a long-term commitment. We understood 
that given that we were part of a catechismic conflict in that region, we also had to have a sustained long-term commitment. And I don't hear that now. I don't hear that about the Middle East. We, we worry about it. We worry about the implications for our homeland. Frankly, it would be good to hear, and I think it would be reassuring to our allies in the region, if we were talking about a Marshall-type plan, a long-term commitment, if you will, to that region, because we believe fundamentally they will resolve the conflict, but we will still be their partner. Wouldn't the best thing be to uh, partner with one of the few um, stabilized, you know, intact states left, that being Iran? Well, it seems to me, based on reading the newspaper, we're doing that. Yeah. I mean, I would, we can get into what we all think of that, but certainly uh, it sounds like that's part of what we're doing. Um, okay, let's come back home uh, just a little bit. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about... Um, not just the uh, ideology that's being uh, received from ISIS, but then also uh, how you know this violent ideology is being carried out. And one of the ways that um, you know these kind of borderline, maybe mentally unstable people, maybe uh, ideologically inspired people, are carrying out their attacks is there. It's easy for them to get guns, right? It's easy for them if you want to go murder someone. It's easy to go out and buy these guns, and we've heard with uh, the Dylan Roof case, for example, that, that um, you know, there's a three-day waiting period that was kind of, you know, busted. Um, so I guess, Matt, I'll throw this to you. Um, first of all, do you agree with the premise that there's actually sort of a gun control uh, piece to uh, mm -hmm. countering ISIS at home? I mean, I think there's a, as an issue with guns generally, yeah. and, uh, you know, I, I, we heard Director Comey the other night talk about the the background check uh, issue with respect to the, the Charleston shooting. Uh, you know, you look at the, the number of mass casualty, mass shooting events, and they, they're going up every year, and you know, we're in the numbers of dozens of those every year. Um, and so the question is, for example, with the Charleston shooting, the FBI had three days uh, to do a background check. They didn't get back in time to the, to, to the, to the store that sold the gun, um, and, and there was a presumption that if you didn't get back to them within three days, the gun was sold. Other, other gun sellers don't follow that exact rule. They wait for a green light. That seems to me to like something there ought to be a discussion about. I mean, even beyond that, I, when I was at the National Counterterrorism Center, we did a lot of work supporting uh, the, the watch list. Uh, as many of you may know, if, in this country, if you are a known or suspected terrorist, if you are on the watch list as a no-fly, you cannot fly, um, you are still eligible to buy a gun. That does not disqualify you from buying a gun. So if you are a, if there's reason to believe you're a known or suspected terrorist, you can buy a gun. You can go, you can go to the airport, be re rejected from getting on an airplane, but then you can turn around and drive to your local gun store and buy a semi-automatic weapon and carry out a mass shooting. Does that anybody, seems to me like something we ought to be having a conversation about. <laughs> Does anybody on this panel think that makes any kind of sense whatsoever, that you can be on the uh, no-fly list and yet still be able to buy a gun? No. No. It's nuts, right? Yeah. Right. Does anybody on this panel think it's a great idea that if the FBI doesn't get back to you in three days, you can still sell a gun to a guy anyway? No, right? I mean, I do think there are, <laughs> there are hard questions to ask how you administer this, how you make sure it's fairly done, and you, know, you need to be mindful of the rights of Americans. But there seems to me to be an argument, or at least a conversation we could have where we could arrive at some more common sense ways to prevent people who are bent on carrying out destruction from getting guns. And I would just add to that, so the context is legally purchased guns. As we know, with hundreds of millions of weapons here in the U.S., most of them legal, there's still obviously a black market that if somebody wants to acquire a gun, they in all likelihood can do that. Uh, the other context is uh, the, the, the tripwires that are in place that the FBI uses, for example, through the 100-plus Joint Terrorism Task Forces around the country, to identify suspicious behavior that may be a, a indicator of potential terrorist activity. And just using a, a Colorado example that people are familiar with, going back to Najib Bulazazi, right. uh, who was in Denver and was going around with relatives buying peroxide at different locations in the Denver area with the whole idea of, of preparing uh, backpack bombs for the New York City subway. So the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force in Denver had gone out to a number of beauty supply stores to say, if somebody comes in to purchase peroxide, give us a call, because that may be an indicator of a susp suspicious activity. W where there was a failure is that some of those, the employees in some of those stores, they turn over rapidly. 
the individuals who sold the larger quantities, and they went to over a dozen different beauty supply stores, um, did not have that information, and so they didn't think about reporting that activity. And then as we know, the great work from some other agencies coupled with the, the Denver State Police and JTTF following Zazi across the country, doing the stop, and then getting to New York City and being able to disrupt the plot before they were successful. Those tripwires are key uh, opportunities for the US government, state and locals to identify and disrupt a potential plot. So the gun issue is a key one, such as in Chattanooga or other places, but that's just one indicia of potential uh, activity whereas the more, if you want to call them spectacular attacks, could come through other ways, even going back to, to Timothy McVeigh in Oklahoma City, what he's able to do with fuel oil and uh, ammonium nitrate, you know, just that combination and, and the devastation through that means. Uh, a lot of these attacks um, seem to be, the FBI director, uh, Jim Comey, uh, described them as sort of being carried out by mentally unstable individuals. Um, a lot of these attacks if you sort of stripped away the, any of the Islamic or you know, white supremacist language, it would just be shootings by horrible common criminals. Do we at all um, sort of turn these guys into, into martyrs, turn them into you know, icons by assigning them this, uh, this kind of religious or this uh, kind of ideological uh, badge? In other words, are we, are, are we, uh, are we amplifying uh, what are essentially murders by giving them a terrorist uh, sheen? So I, I, the short answer is yes, but I don't, I, I don't think that covers it, right? So it's true of any crime, when, when we as journalists cover it, you amplify it, right? right? And so you always worry about getting the facts out, but not in some way glorifying it. I will tell you, there's a spectrum. It's, it's you know, we will label something terrorist or terrorist inspired, but this is not sort of a sort of single label, right? Mike and I were talking yesterday. There is a spectrum. So the Chattanooga guy, as Mike and I said, is on that low end of the spectrum based on what we know now of, was he inspired? We didn't make that up. Journalists, the government didn't make it up. Yes, he, he, he was clearly r radicalized. That play, and that radicalization played some role in, in that event. There's no question about that. So, but was he sort of at the higher end? I mean, we, we know he listened to Anwar al-Awlaki's sermons. We know he was further radicalized in Jordan. But he was probably at the lower end of the ins terrorist inspired. There will be others who have more sort of factual ties back to a foreign terrorist organization uh, and terrorist inspiration. But I think you kind of, the facts will lead you. I mean, there are going to be some people who are just plain crazy. The Aurora shooter and that tragedy Right? right, there was no indication of his inspiration, but we've got to be willing to call it as we see it, where the facts lead us. But a guy like Abdul Aziz, right? You know, you could imagine twenty or thirty years ago he would be using a like Charles Manson ideology. You know, that I mean, there's going to be a group of people who are violent and who are unstable that are going to grab on to whatever the you know blackest of banners are at the sure. moment, right? Okay. So you, you've got what I've tried to describe as this kind of primal tectonic thing going on up here. But when you come down here to the individual joining, I think a friend and I talked about this yesterday too, it's like the Crips and the Bloods. I mean, they're motivated by the same reason people join Los Angeles street gangs. Alienation, something bigger than self, self-identity, and so on. But it really does matter what gang you join. And if this is the gang you join, it motivates certain types of pathological behavior different from the pathological behaviors over here. Right. Matt, you agree with them? Yeah, I, I basically agree with, with both of you on that. And, and uh, you know, I think uh, there is a certain element of, uh, you know, of, of individual. There are certain people who are just deranged and will grasp onto whatever ideology sort of gives rise to the type of violence we're seeing. And, but I do think it does matter that now we're seeing the sort of pervasive type of information coming out of Syria, coming out of Iraq with ISIS, that seems that has a that does change the the the, the situation on the ground and changes how we have to how we have to think about this. And I'll walk into the controversial discussion of you know what, what when we talk about Islamic extremism or violent extremism. You know at NCTC we were very clear with our analysts we want to understand the religious nature of that message. We need to understand the how it relates to Islam. What what is it about the message that's being sent? And you have to study that from the religious point of view to understand how to defeat it. So 
at least within, you know, within the government, I, I want to kind of put to rest the idea that we were afraid to call it Islamic or Islamic extremism. We weren't. We, we, we needed to understand exactly what it was that we were seeing, why that message had a religious basis to it, why it might resonate with certain people, which isn't to say that, as you pointed out very early on, General, that you know, this is not about all of Islam, right? It's, and that's a, also a key point to make as well. Do you think there's a fear of, uh, of tackling uh, uh, white supremacist uh, terrorist groups or far-right terrorist groups? Um, I know that there was, for example, it, uh, there was a DHS report that came out a few years ago uh, that talked about the uh, concerns of this group and sort of generated a political firestorm when it, when it went public. Uh, do you think within the government there's that same kind of reluctance to uh, talk about these groups? Uh, John would be the best to address this from the <laughs> yeah, FBI perspective. Yeah. No, the answer is no. Though. No, from my 27 yeah. years at the FBI and, and on you know, four and a half DSA, no, there was no reluctance. I think sometimes we in the government and, and the media are in a rush to label and put in a box mm. who this person is yeah. because we're trying to get to the root causes of, well, what can we learn? What lessons can we learn from that so we can prevent the next attack? But just getting to, for example, aviation security, if it's somebody getting on a plane in Paris who's been in the Middle East, been in one of the training camps in Syria, for example, and if they are affiliated with AQ or Khorasan Group or Al-Nusra Front, sometimes those labels are not as important as what are the capabilities. Now, it's important to take away their training camps, which DOD and others have been doing a great job at, um, but the notion of do they self-identify, uh, for example, Abdul Matab, what would he say, well, uh, I'm AQAP, um, and it, again, I think we overly focus on that because we want to prevent the next attack. And in the bottom line, if somebody gets on a plane and blows it up, uh, was the fact that they were more Nizr Front or ISIS or AQAP, yeah, if you're talking about ungoverned spaces or spaces governed by ISIS in this case, yeah, that's a bad thing and the government's doing the right thing trying to take away those spaces. But in the final analysis, if you've got 250 dead people because somebody blew the plane up, problem is what didn't work well in terms of preventing that person from getting on the plane. So you're saying that, that the sort of direct motivations, the ideological motivations of some of these characters is kind of of secondary importance? Well, well so you take it from the standpoint, if you're the victim of violent crime, do you care whether it was a deranged person or a terrorist? I mean, if somebody confronts you on the street and, and you know, robs you and then kills you, that's not that important, obviously. Uh, your, your family might be concerned about that. But the key is, what can we be doing as a society to prevent things like that happening? And so that's where, going back to the 800,000 state and local police, I, their top priority is not uh, terrorism. Domestic violence, uh, guns, drugs, DUIs, things like that, that's what they're focused on. So that's what we have to make sure that we're focusing our energies in the best way that helps buy down risk, both domestically, and I would say that the uh, aviation security, which I know a little bit about, is, 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 a, is the best paradigm for that domestic uh, homeland security and national security because of the intersection of you know, 275 airports around the world, nonstop service to the U.S., 300 with cargo service. We've got to have a strong domestic policy that takes away those, those ungoverned spaces so they can't train for it, but we also have to make sure that we're doing everything we can domestically as part of the, the IC and the law enforcement community and Homeland Security community to make sure we're buying down risk without trying to eliminate risk. Okay, now you brought up aviation security. I think that was Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta ask, okay, so the TSA was basically created to stop Al-Qaeda Corps, right. right? To stop a spectacular airplane attack. Um, Al-Qaeda Corps by all estimates <laughs> including, I'm sure, the people on the stage and the people who have previously been on the stage, is basically on the outs. Um, you know, spe thankfully, spectacular you know, airplane attacks have been minimal, uh, or you know, plots have been minimal. So um, yet, on the other hand, like my five-year-old is still getting uh, singled out for secondary screening. Really? So that happened <laughs> recently. Um, and my five-year-old is a lovely kid who poses no, ter no terrorist danger. So when are we going to start to see some real um, sort of sanity restored uh, to aviation security? And when is my kid going to be uh, able to pass through without uh, uh, getting uh, labeled a terrorist threat? So, so just to clarify, you're saying there's no derogatory information about your five-year-old? <laughs> okay. okay. Other, than, other than his dad. Obviously. Okay, okay. J just trying to clarify that. Yeah, so I think if you look at why TSA was created, obviously it was to prevent the hijacking that we saw on 9-11. Yeah. 
as the threats have evolved, the clearest threat now is obviously the non-metallic IED, which we saw on Christmas Day in a second gen generation device in, in April, May of 2012. So that is the evolving threat, and it's coming from overseas, vice that of the 450 airports in the US. That being said, the concern is that, that that recipe, that formula for that device has been shared, and it's almost ubiquitous in terms of go to Inspire Magazine, there's how to do it with uh, helpful suggestions and everything. So the concern is how does TSA, DHS, and the community uh, change to address the threat, recognizing that you still have to be mindful of past threats. You never want to make, make, want to make sure that the past threats or the hijackings could, could take place. So I say as the threats evolve, the challenge and key is to stay at least a half step ahead of what the terrorists are thinking, and how do you best do that in a way that facilitates free movement of people good, goods with the best security. And I'd just be curious, show of hands, if you go through TSA PreCheck? Yeah. OK, so, yeah. so that's one of, uh, one of those evolutions. Needs so, PreCheck. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those evolutions. You wouldn't have seen that in 2002 or yeah. 2003, because it was a different threat. And, and the, it just wasn't a mature enough organization in terms of technology or intelligence sharing, with, again, intelligence being the best opportunity to detect and deter a putative terrorist. Right, and I know that you uh, really championed an intelligence-driven approach at TSA and tried to restore some, some common sense there. Um, if the political pressures were off and you know, there wasn't gonna be this pressure from Congress to have a sort of 100% um, success rate, um, what would you do differently right now? What procedures would you relax? What procedures would you put in place? Well, there's a number of things that, that my predecessor uh, is, is working on, Pete Neffinger, and so we'd defer to him on that. But I think the key is to have the broadest possible enrollment of people uh, in, in TSA PreCheck and Global Entry Course if you travel, travel internationally. Because the whole notion is how can you buy down risk because you know and have better confidence that the person traveling, General Mike Hayden, for example, is probably a low risk. Not that there's no risk. I mean, we all know, <laughs> not with any people. You know, but you know, Robert Hansen in the FBI, uh, Rick Ames in, in CIA, Major Hassan, just because you're part of a trusted group. But yeah, I, I think the notion is, how do you have the broadest cross-section of the 650 million people who travel every year, many of those multiple travelers, obviously, are part of that known trusted group so you can buy down risk and facilitate that movement of people and goods with the best security. Um, we're gonna take questions from the audience in just a second. Um, so get your questions ready, and uh, please let's have them be questions and not uh, rants, raves, uh, uh, statements of uh, uh, ideological, uh, <laughs> I won't even finish up. Um, uh, but before I do, um, you know, you guys have all now been out of government a little bit and taken a look at um, where we are, um, you know, 14, 15 years post 9-11. And I was wondering if, um, if you could take a do-over for any policy that, you, that this country took, um, what would it be? You know, more broadly, I would say, look, what we've learned in the wake of sort of the transfer of power in a new administration, the, the changes in Congress, um, the leaks of Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, when you look at all the things that have happened subsequent, right, um, you, I say to myself, the most important thing in any democratic society is for the government to remember that it, it has only that power given to it by the people whom it represents. And so it is the consent of the governed, right, in any democracy. I say that because what that really, what you're reminded of, look, you've got really, and, and to Clark's credit, you had a tremendous amount of people from really senior leadership positions. It's a credit to the Security Forum and to Clark, but they're here because it's a, a good use of their time, it's a good investment. And but they're listening, right? It's an exchange of ideas. There's a transparency in having Jim Clapper and Jim Comey come up here and talk on the record, on videotape, and I wish we had done more of that earlier. I think particularly in a post 9-11 environment, what you find is really good public, dedicated public servants who are trying to do the right thing are working in a crisis, they have too much to do, too little time to do it, and not sufficient resources. And they're constantly making choices on our behalf. Um, and in retrospect, I think what I've learned coming away is, I wish I'd spent more time 
outside the confines of the skiff that was my office in the basement of the West Wing, talking to people and listening to people and asking, uh, bouncing ideas off as we were making the policy. You know, in a crisis, you don't really have the luxury of time, but I will tell you, I am convinced now more than ever um, that that transparency and that dialogue, to the extent you can, I mean, some things you just can't because you gotta protect secrets, but to the extent you're able to, it's really important to the health, well-being of a democratic society and to the, to the people who are inside executing the, the policy, the public servants, that they know that they have the support of the American people because they can't be successful without it. Okay, so that's a procedural do-over. Is there a specific thing, I don't know, uh, invading a certain country, <laughs> pull, uh, <laughs> pulling the troops out of that country maybe a little early, uh, maybe certain controversial programs that, I don't know, you know, looked at metadata of a lot of uh, people around the world, uh, anything like that that you'd do over? But there, there are, it's some, but some of, some of this comes back to what I was saying. I mean, we're gonna let Mike take some of the controversial programs because <laughs> he, he, he frankly had the burden of having to, to exercise the authorities. But I, I will tell you, um, so let's use metadata as an example, right? You got eight private companies, some of whom are in this room, who believed they were acting on valid legal authorities with good reason. Right, just as there were men and women in the CIA acting on what they had every reason to believe were legitimate legal authorities, and so I mean I think to, to say that I mean I, I think it is unfair. It's an unfair question. Would you do it over? Well, no, not if, if you'd known there was not a valid legal authority. Yeah, sure you'd do it over. But people acted on, in good faith on the authorities they believed that they had. Joe, I've got another process um, uh, addition. Now, Fran talks about <laughs> broadly talking about to the American people and everything she said, I associate myself with those remarks. More narrowly, an awful lot, I think by and large, on terrorism, all right? The Iraq war, other things, different questions. But on terrorism, I think by and large, we've made the right decisions for the time in which the decisions were made, which doesn't mean that in 2006, I should make the same decisions at CIA that George Tenet made in 2002. I think the, the right phrase here is, what you want for this is a dial, not a switch. But just because I changed detention policy, for example, in no way does that suggest George had it wrong when he had different circumstances within which to deal. So I think by, by and large, I'm actually pretty comfortable with, with, with the policies. What I'm not comfortable with is that we anchored them almost exclusively on the authority of the executive and that we did not bring the other political branch into these discussions earlier. And we made that a divisive force in the country. We knew that was gonna be a divisive force at some point later. Let me be very unfair as per member of the permanent government, all right? I, the permanent government wants to bring Congress in as early and as much and as fulsomely as possible, right? You, you, want, you, you want these guys if they want to do their moral printing, do their moral printing when everyone's scared and no one knows what the future is going to be like, okay? rather than the way we did it, which is kind of take the decision away from them, do what we had to do, keep the country safe, and now when everyone's more comfortable again, they get to go back and check your homework. It's not good for the agencies because it takes the guts out of their willingness to take risk, and it's really not good for the country. Matt? So, I mean, any panel that's called you know, rethinking our approach has to begin with a pretty healthy dose of humility about, right. about that and, and exactly along the lines that you mentioned, General, and looking back. And also with a strong sense of appreciation to the dedication of all the people working back home, overseas, people who've been here on this panel, who are in, in office now. So I think you begin with that. A specific example, I will answer your question specifically. I, I worked on the 9-11 trial, the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed co-conspirator case. I worked with the Attorney General to try to bring that case uh, to a federal court in New York City. That was scuttled. I think that was the right decision. So yeah, we, we, we probably could have done that better and I regret that, it's, that it didn't end up because I think it would have been over with now with, with, uh, with sentences on all of those co-conspirators. Um, but, a, but a broader answer to your question, I think, if I could take liberty with that, is just to say, you know, I, I think again, agreeing with you, General Hayden, that largely in the terrorism realm, we've done exactly uh, the right things. And I think when you look at a, a, a specific example of a, just about a year ago uh, in June of last year, uh, Abu Qatala, one of the alleged ringleaders of the Benghazi attack that killed four Americans, including 
Ambassador Chris Stevens. He was in Benghazi leading his criminal gang and his little arm of militants aligned with Al-Qaeda. Uh, and uh, one night he was picked up uh, by US military forces, put on a ship in the Mediterranean, a Navy ship, and uh, taken back to the United States where he now sits in a jail outside Washington, DC, awaiting trial in a federal court. That's an amazing accomplishment. And that, to your point again from the very beginning, it's very tactical, but it does prove I think that we have come a long way and from a counterterrorism perspective in working together, the intelligence that found him, the military action second to none in the world that was able to pick him up, the law enforcement effort to, to then try him before a federal judiciary here in the United States. That's something to really, really be proud of and something to take stock of. Okay, but even if the counterterrorism machine has become completely well oiled, you know, yet we've still got this emerging Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, yet we still have these lone wolf or lone rat attacks. I mean, it doesn't seem You're like- You're supposed it, to let me in on a high note. You know, <laughs> I just I finished there. No. Yeah. So yeah, of course, we got long problems. We've spent an hour talking about those. Um, and it's, a, it's really gonna take us a long, th those are enduring problems that we're gonna have to continue to work yeah, but, on. Let me, I'm, I'm sorry, I know you need to do this, John. But there's a wonderful Israeli movie called The Gatekeepers. It's a documentary, it's in Hebrew, but subtitled. It's interviews with the six heads of Shin Bet and with what Shin Bet had to do to keep Israel safe, all right? And you had these six leaders pretty much condemning their governments because I, I went and did the dirty, hard work for you to create space for you to create political right. solutions, and you have not done that. And so if you're looking for, I, I think that's what, what you were saying, and it's certainly what I'm saying with regard to where we've been short. And so are you saying, are you making an equivalent uh, uh, argument with America that you guys have done the dirty work and we, the, the political types haven't done the uh, we that close fight agreements. that close fight we have won and won decisively as bad as Chattanooga was all right uh, it, it it was a disaster it was it was a great sadness it wasn't a catastrophe right all right and so we, we have done that well but it, again back to my first point you've got these primal things going on and they're very difficult for us to affect I get it but that's that's where we're gonna win or lose in the long term. John? Yeah, I would just uh, use a, a quick story uh, and uh, going back to the, the tragic shooting at, at Fort Hood, uh, following that, there was obviously a lot of interest in so what happened, what was missed. Uh, Jim Clapper, Mike Leiter, and I, uh, the three of us, went up and briefed uh, the Hill nine separate times, some classified, some open. And uh, one of the, the phrases that we came away with after that is the blinding clarity of hindsight. And that notion that, you know, of course, looking back, well, what could we have done differently? In, this, in that instance, I, I wish that the FBI, the Joint Terrorism Task Force in San Diego that, that had that lead because of communications with the Lockheed, and DOD uh, that was embedded there, and then working with uh, DOD in Washington, had done a better job of sharing information. The outcomes, I'm not sure, but there were some things in place that uh, decisions were made at a relatively low level not to share information. But given that blinding clarity of hindsight, I'm always reluctant to go beyond what I had responsibility for uh, to say that we should do something differently. I'll, I'll make an exception to that you know, on, on a very broad issue, and it's, it's what you raised, um, because going back, I can't help but wonder that if we had not invaded Iraq, how things would have turned out differently. Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, again, let's uh, keep them as questions. Uh, Ambassador Filey? <laughs> Since we're talking about Iraq. Yep. Uh, Lukman Fader, Iraq Ambassador. The title talks about rethink our approach. Uh, now you are outside the government and we are part of, of what you call permanent governments or legislators. Do you think that the United States is willing to rethink fundamentally its approach to the Middle East region, i.e. more soul searching and more importantly, to apologize if it had mistakes? Uh, so the question was, uh, do you think the U.S. is willing to do some soul searching about its policies in the Middle East and to really rethink its approach? And is it willing to apologize for some of its mistakes? Is it, do I have that right? Anybody want to take that one? Well, I, I, you know, I, I was trying, trying to express in my provocative remarks that this, this is a fundamental reshuffling. And if we don't address it at that level, we are forever going to get it wrong. And, and so uh, I, I guess... Yeah, I'm actually calling for a, a, a fundamental reassessment of what the Middle East is, what its people want, what its cultural and historical dynamics are driving it towards, and we need to, we need to accommodate to that. We, look, we, we're not doing stick and rudder on this. At best, we, we tuck it in a little left, a little right, 
And so we have to align our policies with realities. Uh, let's go all the way in the back in the pink shirt. My name is Kent Blackmer, and I represent the local transit authority, the Roaring Fork Transportation Authority. Mm -mm. And it's been discussed that the refugee problem coming from North Africa and the vacuums in these countries provide great sources for terrorism. And yet, I'm not sure what the cultural advance teams of these secret operatives in the special operations groups are telling the man on the street in Libya about what they should do. Can someone explain to me what that message is? Well, I, I'm not sure. I, I think if I understand your question, you know, there and, and perhaps General Votel talked about uh, the cultural uh, teams. Uh, I, you know that. Look, these are largely tactical operations. They're not necessarily uh, advanced teams to deal with the broader problems of, of uh, the lack of governance in the countries that I talked about in places like Libya um, and, and Tunisia or, 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 or Mali or other places, or the problem of, of immigration. But you know, to your general point, sir, about the, there, I do think that what we see coming out of North Africa into Europe, that is a, that's a, a broad, uh, that, that presents a broad set of problems, and again, terrorism, and extremism is a subset because as we deal with the problem of ISIS-inspired uh, radicalization and violence in the United States, the problem is many times worse in Europe. If you talk, when we talk to our European colleagues, they face this issue on, on a much, uh, much more significant scale than we do here at home. Let me, can I just add to that? So you've got, I mean, just out of Syria alone, let me give you some numbers, right? Four million refugees out of Syria, 7.8 million displaced persons, the largest humanitarian and refugee crisis since World War II. And I do worry. I think, you know, when, when General Ray Odierno last week says the fight against ISIS is a 10 to 20 year fight, part of what's embedded in that is you've got two more generations who feel alienated, abandoned by the West. It really comes back to the ambassador's question about rethinking what our policy is in the Middle East. But if we don't invest in helping to deal with that humanitarian and refugee crisis, it will come back to us in the form of terrorism. That's a great point. Um, let's go uh, all the way over there. Thank you for a great panel. Karen Brooks, Counts on Foreign Relations. Uh, General Hayden, you said we're witnessing the end of nation states in Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. I wonder what you see coming in their place. And you said that by focusing on, in essence, trying to keep these states together, we are ignoring a range of other options at a policy level available to us. I wonder if you could elaborate. Sure. Um, I don't know how it ends up. And look, the states currently known as Iraq and Syria may keep a single seat up at Turtle Bay in the United Nations. But, but as unitary states, I, I think their time in history is gone because they were, in essence, artificial. I mean, Iraq, for, for the Ottoman Empire, Empire was three vilayets, okay? Mosul, Baghdad, Basra, go figure. I mean, the three primary ethnic groups. Uh, right now, the only organized military force in Iraq fighting for Iraq are the 3,500 Americans, okay? Everyone else is, is, is a factional force. So I, I think it's gonna be very hard to put it together and, and maybe not even necessary. And so there may be other dynamics there. Um, you asked about, well, why don't you double down on people who think like you? You said the Iranians. Mm -hmm. I would say the Kurds, who've, who've proven themselves to be a very reliable ally and, frankly, would provide a, a basis, I think, for us to know. I realize that makes it very difficult with Turkey and, and, and other countries as well, but it's a reality. With regard to what it looks like in the future, I don't know. There are multiple wars, as Fran said. You've got Sunni Sunni, you've got Sunni Shia, you've got autocrat Democrat, you've got religious zealot secularist, all going on. I fundamentally think, at the end of all this, the most powerful dynamic in creating the new order will be the Sunni-Shia split. We had a little petri dish going on in Yemen. It's got all those multiple conflicts. But the longer it's gone on, the more it's Sunni-Shia. And I think that's going to be the macro picture. Uh, let's go here. Uh... Paul Emmert, the Monsieur of Belgium, thank you. On the counter messaging, I was just uh, curious. You, um, you mostly refer to the classical outreach to imams and mosques this panel. Yesterday, Gilles de Kerkhove mentioned the converts. 
So basically, Christians, Jews, even Buddhists joined the fight, which would mean that any American could become an ISIL fighter. So how broad do you do your outreach, or what do you do about that? So the question was, uh, the, uh, ISIS has talked about converts. So do you need to sort of extend the outreach to non-Muslim communities as well? Is that right? OK. Anybody want to take that? Look, I, 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 the short answer is I think you, you have to pick a place to start. And by the way, we haven't. So uh, at least we're in baby steps. And so I think the, you'd start with the near-term tactical problem, which is the Islamic extremist problem here inside the United States that you've got to deal with because it's the most immediate threat. But ultimately, yeah, I think you're going you're gonna to have to expand it as the facts, the intelligence, the evidence takes you, and you may have to. But I think right now you hear people talking about focusing on outreach to the, in, in the United States to Muslim communities uh, because that's where we see the threat coming from right now. Got, got time for one last one. Uh, let's go here in the front. Uh, my name is Mark Trebelli, and I'm one of the Aspen Scholars. In, turn, in the spirit of the reset, um, what sort of expectations should we have in terms of security? Um, is it that you can, the, the national security establishment can detect and interdict 9-11 style attacks, and we should just accept a higher risk for, you know, those lone wolf attacks that, that you know, are low, Im low impact but higher probability? Um, and sort of what are realistic expectations of the national security establishment that we should have? That's a great question. Matt, Matt's, Matt's got a good answer for this. I'll give you a really short one. Several years ago, people like us were saying, future attacks against the American homeland, because of our success, future attacks against the American homeland will be less complex, less well organized, less likely to succeed, and less lethal even if they do succeed. They will just be more numerous. And I think that was spot on. Yeah, totally agree. That's what we're seeing now. I mean, you, the premise of your question uh, is the answer. We're seeing much less complicated, much less sophisticated, much less lethal, tragic nonetheless, but much less uh, uh, lethal in terms of the consequences, but, but more common types of attacks. Uh, the one plug I'll put in here at the end is to say, and, and I think this goes a little bit to John's point, is our, our ability to, to conduct effective surveillance is critical to our ability to stop even the smaller scale attacks, and we've lost some of that capability in the last few years. And that makes us less safe because we're much less, much more able to stop an attack, whether it's coming out of Yemen or, or here at home, if we're doing it based on our ability to intercept communications lawfully rather than waiting for someone to get on an airplane or, or you know, go to a, 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 a shopping mall with a gun. And I, I, the I, one thing I would add to that is that, look, just as we got better over time at preventing the mass casualty type 9-11 event, you should expect we will get better over time at detection, prevention of these smaller things right. because we learn. We will, the more data we've got, the better we get. And so those inside the government will continue to improve their effectiveness against these less complicated attacks. And I would just add um, that there's a cost of buying down risk. Obviously, there's a trade-off. Right. And so there's a continuum of risk. And the more that you try to, to buy down risk, and use just TSA as an example to say, OK, in the post-9-11 world, TSA is created. It was a one-size-fits-all approach. Let's treat every single person as a, as a potential terrorist. There's a cost of doing that, both in terms of efficiency and obviously buy-in from, from travelers and all that. The more you go to a risk-based approach, which Secretary Johnson and, and Admiral Neffinger are pursuing, it's that opportunity to reduce risk without trying to eliminate risk. Because when you try to do that, it, uh, there, that cost just exceeds what society and general public and, and what the government can do. So it's that partnership in buying down risk in a way that uh, manages risk in, a, in an efficient way. That, that decision by Congress on the um, USA Freedom Act that, that changed the procedure for metadata made you all, made many in this country a lot more comfortable, probably made us a little more safe, a little less safe. That's okay, we get it, as John said, that that's a social contract we have, we just all have to understand those are the trades. But what I hear is, I mean, there's some in the security community that say, look, you know, these lone wolf attacks you know, onesie, twosie, th that basically that's an acceptable amount of violence, uh, political violence in this country. And I think I hear what you saying, what all four of you saying is, actually, no, that's still not uh, an acceptable level. Is that right? Yeah, I would say it's not, ex it's not acceptable from, from any means, but it is a reality. And that's the pragmatism is you can't prevent every bad act from happening. And so just as in violent crime, 
drugs, gun trafficking, whatever, you can't prevent every criminal act. And so how do you best buy down risk using the, the myriad resources available to everybody? The goal, the goal will always be 100% success on the right. part of the national sure. security community. Sure. It will always, right. regardless of administration, be the goal. I think what you're hearing is, the, pragmatically, we recognize, we understand you're going to have, you're likely to continue to see small scale things get through. But okay. we're going to continue to try to stop them all. Um, I think we've got to end it there. Uh, let's give a round of applause to our panel.